It's been a fabulous conference. Uh, yesterday I was particularly struck by a theme which I think is the irrationality of so many environmental positions. It's like a mass delusion. The, the general public, or certainly the media, or often the general public, simply head off and decide to believe something which is not true. So why is it so? I thought I might talk about this today. Um, how did we get to this strange situation in public debate where so many people believe so many things for which there is no basis? Um, one of the strange things about modern life is the safer we become, the more timid and, and scared we seem to become. And it's not just an environmental thing, uh, it occurs in lots of areas, particularly health. Last week I came home from work and my seven-year-old daughter had this wristband which said saveourwhales.gov.au and she told me the whole story about how the whales are in a terrible danger and, and men are out there killing them off Sydney Harbour and everything. And um, it turns out that these federal government has got a website where kids can actually write in and get these wristbands for free. And um, I mean that's offensive not just because it raises questions about whaling, which Jennifer's blog site has talked about at some length, um, but also it's introducing children like my daughter into this whole world of these conspicuous, compassion, caring wristbands, which are a particularly um, unpleasant aspect of modern life. I know the bands, they, they do have a purpose for older kids, they assist with um, a sort of mating. They tell members of the opposite sex if you actually share their politics. It must be a terrible thing to go to bed with someone and wake up the next morning and discover that they're not opposed to ending global poverty or something. But I object to seven-year-olds being introduced into this world of intellectual and moral fashion quite so early. We've got porn filters on our computers now. We should have Ian Campbell filters too. I think it's, it's just bizarre that a conservative government is pumping out this sort of propaganda using our money. Now, I think this suits the Green Movement admirably, and I'd like to talk about the Green Movement a bit now. Um, basically, if you have these people living in the cities who, on the one hand, care passionately about the environment, but on the other don't really know about it, they have very little experience of it, you can basically lie to them as much as you like, as long as it's a plausible story uh, that fits in with this desire to see the landscape as a sort of backdrop for a moral drama, then the urban people will be happy, and I think that's what's going on. And basically, the Green Movement, and Walter Stark alluded to this yesterday, um, is in the business of selling fear. You know, the Green Movement sells fear in the way that General Motors sells motor cars. And just like General Motors needs new models of cars to try and persuade people to give them money, so too does the Green Movement need a continual succession of <coughs> concerns and fears uh, to keep people giving them money, to keep those officials in jobs. There's a constant need for people to give them donations, for people to be members. So I think there is actually a business model at the heart of uh, many green groups, even though we like to think of them as purely idealistic. Um, obviously the media like these scare stories because they sell newspapers. Um, fear does sell newspapers, unfortunately. If there was nothing in the newspaper that you had to worry about, people wouldn't buy newspapers. So there is a sort of alliance there, obviously, between the media and the green movement. The green movement manufactures the fears. The newspapers are very happy to pass them on and be entirely unskeptical about them. Uh, because they want to stay in business. Um, newspapers in particular are in decline around the world, around the Western world. They're desperate to hang on to, um, to readers. They're becoming increasingly tabloidised. And of course, the green groups provide them with these wonderful stories all the time. So um, how do you change this? How can the eight year influence the media? This is the big question. There are two things I'd like to say about journalists. First of all, journalists um, are pretty lazy. Um, if we're doing a story, we, we want a quote that represents various points of view and we want to get it fairly quickly. So if we have a number that we can ring to get that point of view, then we'll ring that number, we'll put it in the story, and that's the problem solved in a sense. Now, journalists, most journalists do feel the obligation to at least throw in different points of view, even though when you're writing a story, you can then, of course, construct the whole thing to present what you really feel. But you've got to have this at least veneer of objectivity. And so I think if the AEF is successful, you know, in establishing yourself in the mind of journalists as a reputable source, not just reputable, but uh, accessible, consistently accessible source, I think there's a huge potential for, um, for you to find a place in public debate. Um, the second thing about journalists is, for all our faults, um, we don't like to be shamed, we don't like to be proved to be factually wrong. We do believe in reason, or at least we say we believe in reason, and if someone can show that we have been irrational, that we've got things wrong, we don't like that. If I look at the challenge you have to try and change the way journalists actually act on the job, I can actually see that that's, that's achievable in a fairly short time. Um, I, I, just, I just think that, that there's a lot of grounds for hope there. 